Christina Foxley, Director of Events. Good evening and welcome to The Strand. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Michio Kaku here tonight to, here tonight to, to discuss physics of the future, how science will shape human destiny and our daily lives by the year 2100. Revelations from physics of the future include sensors in our clothing, bedroom, and appliances will monitor our vitals and nanobots will scan our DNA and cells for signs of danger, allowing life expectancy to increase dramatically to 150 years. Cars will drive themselves using GPS. Internet-enabled contact lenses will allow us to access the world's information base or conjure up any image we desire in the blink of an eye. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. Michio Kaku is a professor of theoretical physics at the City University of New York, co-founder of String Field Theory, and the best-selling author of several widely acclaimed science books, including Hyperspace and Physics of the Impossible, the basis for his science channel TV show, Sci-Fi Science, and two radio programs, Explorations and Science Fantastic, broadcasting to over 140 radio stations. Following his presentation, Dr. Kaku will take your questions. I will pass around a microphone, so please wait for that before you speak. He will then stick around to sign copies of his books for you, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. Please join me in welcoming the man whom New York Magazine called one of the 100 smartest men in New York City, in New York, excuse me, the enlightening Dr. Michio Kaku to the stream. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be with you here at the Strand Bookstore. However, I have a confession to make. You see, it's true that New York Magazine voted me as one of the 100 smartest people in New York, but in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> so how authoritative could that be? Now, I'm a physicist. We physicists invented the laser. We invented the transistor. We created the first computer. We created the internet. We wrote the World Wide Web. We created television. We invented radio, radar, microwaves, MRI scans. You name it, a physicist helped to invent it. And we physicists love to make predictions. So when we helped to invent the internet, one physicist said that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. Well, today we know that 5% of the Internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the Internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on the Internet. Then 50% of the Internet will be pornography. <laughs> and let me also say that we physicists make predictions all the way out to the end of the universe. My colleagues, Stephen Hawking and many others, they make predictions going all the way out to the end of the universe. So let me now quote from that great philosopher of the Western world, Woody Allen. Woody Allen once said, quote, Eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. <laughs> so today, I'm going to talk about the future, your future. I've had a chance to have a ringside seat with BBC Television, Science Channel, Discovery Channel, and my own radio show to interview the leading scientists of our time who are inventing the future in their laboratories. These are the people doing the yeoman's work of actually building the future. So let me now quote from that other great philosopher of the Western world, Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra once said, quote, Prediction is awfully hard to do especially if it's about the future. <laughs> well, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So let's turn down the lights, and I will now tell you what was told to me by the Nobel laureates, the directors of the major laboratories, and I'm going to take you to the next 20, 50, the next 100 years. This is the book, Physics of the Future. If you get Newsweek Magazine, I'll be a columnist for Newsweek Magazine. And the last issue excerpted part of the book. Also, if you're a fan of the New York Post, this Sunday, the New York Post is also excerpting this. 
And I should also point out that personally, I'm very much involved with what's happening in Japan right now. I have relatives there. They're very concerned. We call them daily. In fact, right after this lecture, I'll be going to Nightline. I'll be on Nightline tonight talking about the unfolding tragedy in Japan. And also tomorrow morning, I'll be on Good Morning America, also talking about the unfolding developments. But anyway, let me talk about some of my passions. One of them is to go way into the future, and that's my last book, Physics of the Impossible, talking about what I do for a living. What I do for a living is work on time machines. Wormholes, psychokinesis, starships, warp drive. That's what I do for a living. So let's now predict the next 100 years. The year is now 1863. It's a time of the American Civil War. America is gripped in this horrendous civil war. And a man in Paris called Jules Verne decides to predict the next 100 years. And he writes two books. One book is called From the Earth to the Moon. He predicted that we would have a moon rocket launched from Florida. It would orbit around the moon in three days, and it would touch down back on the Earth in a splash. He predicted weightlessness. He predicted the size of the capsule to within 10% accuracy. The velocity, the size, everything was right. How did Verne do it? How did Verne predict what was going to happen in 1969? And then he predicted Paris in 1960. The year is 1863. He predicted that in Paris in 1960, we would have glass skyscrapers. We would have automobiles, gas-fired automobiles. We would have fax machines and something resembling the Internet. How could he do that? He did it because he was a science junkie. He knew everything about who was doing what in science. Anytime someone passed by Paris, he'd sit down with them, pump them for information about moon rockets and about the future of buildings and the future of communication. So I said to myself, well, Vern can do it. Why don't I try to do it? It's a tall order, I said to myself. So I said to myself the following. In order to predict the future, let's look at the past. Let's go back to the year 1900, the year of our grandparents and the year of our great-grandparents. What was life like in 1900? Well, first, you didn't live very long. Life expectancy was around 40 years of age in Europe and the United States. Most people made their living as dirt farmers. High tech meant the telegraph, and most people didn't even have access to a telegraph. So what was life like? Well, it was not very pleasant. Life was short, and life was brutish. However, if you were to go back 100 years and visit your grandparents, what would they think of you? What would they think of you? You would go back 100 years. And you would talk about a world of rocket ships, a world of atomic bombs, a world of sports cars speeding at 150 miles an hour when the average horse went 10 miles an hour, if you were lucky, a world of electricity, lights everywhere. And how would they view you? They would view you as a, a wizard. They would view you as a sorcerer. Look at this. Your grandparents would say, oh, my God. This is the work of sorcery, talking to pictures on the other side of the world, bombs of enormous destructive power. And now, I want you, I challenge you, to imagine what your grandkids and what your grandkids will have in the year 2100. That's the challenge for today. My challenge is to unveil what our grandkids and grandkids, what they will have. If they were to visit us today, right now, in this room, what would they look like? What would they have? We would view them as a god of mythology. It's not too bad being a god, you know. There are a lot of perks being a god. First of all, if you're like Zeus or one of the Greek gods, just by thinking, just by thinking about it, you can conjure up things. 
move things around mentally, conjure up things that don't exist. Our bodies would be perfect, ageless. We would age, but age so slowly would be imperceptible. We would have flying chariots flying through the sky effortlessly. And then we'd be able to play with life itself. This is the power of a god of mythology, something that is inconceivable to us. But believe it or not, my friends are going to make this dream possible. So you're now meeting the world of your grandkids. So if we have this power, the power of the gods of mythology, will we also have the wisdom of Solomon? Well, I don't know about that. Even the gods had foolishness. If you know anything about Greek mythology, the Greek gods spent most of the time chasing each other, engaging in mischief. Here's Loki, the god of mischief himself, planning the twilight of the gods. So there's a morality lesson I also mention in the book, and that is if you have the power of the gods, be sure you have the wisdom of Solomon to go with it. So let's now take you on a guided tour of the world of your grandkids. First of all, the last 50 years have been dominated by something called Moore's Law. Moore's Law allows you to predict the future. It simply says computer power doubles every 18 months. Now look at that curve. Look at that curve. The wealth of nations, the power of the United States, the high-tech wizardry all around us is a byproduct of this one curve. This curve says that when you get a birthday card in the mail, and it sings happy birthday. You open it up, there's a chip. It sings happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. What do you do with that chip? You throw it away. Well, that chip has more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945. Hitler, Heinz, uh, Hitler and Churchill and Roosevelt would have killed to get that chip. And what do you do? You throw away it in the garbage. Well, take a look at the future, ladies and gentlemen. You just extend that curve to 2020, and what will a chip cost? One penny. Imagine a world now where chips cost a penny. How will we communicate? Well, let's look into the future. Moore's Law allows you to predict that in the 1960s, we would have mainframe computers, huge computers the size of a room. In the 1970s, we had computers the size of this desk, this podium. That's what a computer looked like in 1970. Today, we have PCs that dominate the 80s. In the 90s, we had the Internet. In the 2000s, we have ubiquitous computing. Chips are leaving the computer. Chips are getting into clothing. Chips are getting into toys. Chips are getting everywhere. 2010, we're talking about advanced sensors that can detect cancer. This is going to revolutionize medical care in the next decade and beyond that. Mind control of computers, the power of the gods. So let's take it. First, the Internet. My colleagues helped to invent the Internet. And you see that where there's the Internet, there's wealth. Where there's no Internet, there's poverty, ignorance, and disease. With the Internet comes wealth. So let's talk about wealth. First of all, what will a computer look like in 2020, 2030? Well, welcome to the future. These are Internet glasses. These are glasses that have a full Internet capability. Any, any website, any motion picture. This is your home office of the future. This is your home entertainment center of the future. And when you meet somebody in a hallway at a conference, and you say to yourself, I know this person. Who is this person? He's John, Jake, Jim. I know this person, right? Well, in the future, your glasses will say, it's Jim, stupid. Remember? You met him last week. You want to see his entire biography? You will see his entire biography in your glasses. And then you're at a cocktail party. You know there's some very important people at that cocktail party. They can offer you a job. But you don't know who they are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. Okay? And also, let's say they speak Chinese. You can't speak Chinese. No problem. In the future, your contact, your, your glasses will translate Chinese 